We should now worship our holy God through scripture reading. Let us read responsively. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord has given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this, and this is, the, is will the will of him who sent me, that I should, I should lose, lose nothing of all that he has given, given me, but, but raise it up on the last day. day. For, For this is the will of my Father, that, that everyone who looks on the Son and, and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Very good morning. Morning. Well, our brothers and sisters at camp have just started their morning worship about half an hour ago as well. And just like them over in Batam, we will be listening to God's word on personal discipleship. On personal discipleship, which is the theme of the last month, the month of June, if you've been here with us. Uh, here today, we're very glad to welcome our brother preacher, friend from Shalom BP Church, Reverend Ben Sao. Ben was one of the first young pastors I met at some of the BPCIS events, and he was a friend and a good model of what it means to not be faced by age and many obstacles at a young, uh, at a young age entering ministry in his church. So I'm very thankful for him as a person, and today he will also be bringing us the word of God. I'll invite him up here and pray for him before the sermon, please. Shall we pray together? Father, where else can we go, Lord? For you have the words of eternal life. We ask that your spirit will help us to listen to the words of Jesus today. 
through your servant, our brother, Pastor Ben. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Zion Bishan. Well, I send greetings from your smaller sister church, uh, Shalom BP. We are all the way in the east in Pasiris. If you're ever thinking of going for a light uh, walk in the park, uh, please feel free to come and knock on my door and say hi. Now, I like to begin by asking, I wonder if you've ever had a friend who would only get close to you for as long as you had something to give them. Perhaps it's an old friend who wanted to reconnect to you. It's a phone call only to find out that they want to sell you insurance. Perhaps it's a colleague who wanted to get close to you only so that you could help them with their work. Now, how do you feel towards such people? Not a great feeling, isn't it? Sadly, some of us behave that way when it comes to God, only to follow Him for what He can give us. Now, today we are looking at a text where Jesus will confront a crowd which manifested such a similar attitude. And together from this text that we read earlier, we're going to consider various wrong reasons for following Jesus. Now, if you look at your outline, I believe in your bulletin, there's an outline printed for you. We have seven key ideas that we're going to consider today, seven wrong reasons to following Jesus that we want to look together. And our prayer is that the Spirit of God will uncover uh, some of these wrong reasons within our own hearts and, and help us repent from them. Now, before we get to the text proper, let me first set the stage with the context. Now, here up in your screen is an ancient map of Galilee, and down on the bottom right-hand corner, you see a legend with the three characters at play in our text. There was Jesus, his 12 disciples, and a crowd of 5,000. Now, Jesus had just fed the disciples, or rather the 5,000 with the disciples, somewhere on the eastern shore of Galilee. Uh, we saw this at the start of chapter 6, and some scholars think that the feeding actually took place at Bethsaida. Now, when the 5,000 wanted to take Jesus by force uh, to be king, Jesus actually withdrew, right? He went into a mountain. So you see Jesus moving away. And when the evening came, with the crowd gone, his disciples without Jesus went down to the sea and took the only boat uh, available to Capernaum. Now, some of you may know that it was on this journey to, to Capernaum that the disciples were caught in a storm. This is where the famous passage come in, right? And they encountered Jesus walking on water, getting on a boat, and suddenly being transported to Capernaum. So where our text begins is with the crowd that was left at Bethsaida and another group of crowds from Tiberias. These crowds were looking for Jesus at Bethsaida, where the feeding took place. But when they realized that Jesus wasn't there, they all got into boats and they went um, to Capernaum to see Jesus. And when they found him there, they found Jesus there. And so that is the background uh, to our text for today, right? They are, they are right there together with Jesus. Now let's have a read at verse 25 to understand what takes place next. Verse 25 tells us, When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And the reason for the question, of course, was clear. If the disciples had taken the only boat to Capernaum, how did Jesus get across? The crowds were puzzled. Now, Jesus didn't answer that question, but Jesus, um, but as readers, we know what happened, right? Jesus walked on water. He did a miracle without a boat. But Jesus doesn't emphasize that. Instead, Jesus goes on to make a pointed statement, a jarring statement to uncover the wrong reasons for following Jesus. Verse 26, Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You see, Jesus here points out clearly what was wrong with the crowd. They were seeking Jesus not because they were uh, focusing on Jesus, but they were focused on the signs. They were focused on Jesus' food. Remember, the, Jesus had earlier fed the 5,000 and they were after what Jesus could give them. 
Friends, what is the first wrong reason to following Jesus? Well, this is sermon point number one. Do we wrongly follow Jesus only for His gifts and not for Him? Now, understand this. There's nothing really wrong with following Jesus for what He provides. Certainly, the Bible tells us that God is our provider, our Jehovah Jireh, and, and Jesus does tell us to pray for our daily bread. These are right things. But why does Jesus flag out this wrong desire in the hearts of the crowds? You see, the problem is simple. They were overly focused on the gifts rather than the giver. Basically, they were so in love with what Jesus could give them that they had forgotten to love Jesus instead. Now, I know Singaporeans, some of us love uh, Korean dramas. I don't watch any Korean dramas, but I understand that this is a familiar plot. A beautiful but cunning woman, noting seeing a rich man, has so much wealth to offer, marries the rich man, not because he loves the man, but because she's after the money. Now, have ever seen a drama like that? Cunning woman marries a rich man, not for, out of love, but out of love for the money. How do we view such a character in the show? We've discussed, right? We don't like such people. Sadly, many of us could treat Jesus just like that. That we follow Jesus not because we are deeply in love with Jesus, but because we are in love with His gifts, His offer for a place in heaven, His daily provision for wealth, His offer for protection. And, and so we make the mistake of misplacing our love for His gifts instead of Him, the giver. Are we guilty of that? Now, to sermon point number two, to the second wrong reason we can make in following Jesus, do we follow Jesus only for His temporary gifts and not His eternal gifts? So this is point number two. Do we follow Jesus only focusing on His temporary gifts and not His eternal gifts? Now, Jesus goes on in our text in verse 27 to correct the crowd's heart. Verse 27, he says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. Now, what Jesus is telling the crowd here is pretty straightforward in that we humans could have this misplaced desire for temporary things instead of eternal things. That when it comes to God, we are focused on the immediate, for food, for protection, but we forget the eternal things that Jesus has to offer. Eternal things like the glorious gift of, of His kingdom, eternal life. Now imagine with me you're on a long flight on a plane to an amazing holiday destination, and naturally on the flight you will get your, your usual things done, you know, you'll get your books out, you will, you will get some food that's offered to you. But what would you think if that on that flight there is a man beside you that begins, begins to hoard the plain food? He begins to pack everything that is given to him. He keeps all the, the airplane food in his hand luggage, stuffs as much airplane bread in his pockets, and, and fills his bottle with all the airplane drinks that he can get. Now, we probably think that this guy is crazy, right? One, it's not that long of a trip. Two, the food won't last that long. And three, once you get to that amazing holiday destination, all that, that food is lousy in comparison. Friends, those of us who turn to temporal blessings at the expense of eternal blessings are just like that man on the plane, isn't it? We are focused on the immediate, the food, the shelter in this temporary journey of life, like the food and the comfort of the plane. Now, certainly these things are important, right? You need to be comfortable on a plane. But they shouldn't be our key focuses. They shouldn't be our key focus because God is offering us a much greater destination, a much greater gift. And so let us ask ourselves this morning, do we, like the crowds in our text, have this misplaced focus when we look to God? Looking at Him only for temporal gifts. Now, don't get me wrong, it's okay to ask for temporal gifts, but do we focus only for temporal gifts or do we consider the eternal gifts? that God has to offer. You know, sometimes we make this very common mistake. We search for joy in life only by asking God for temporal blessings. God, I could do with more money. God, bless me with, with peace through this difficulty. God, I have this sickness. You must heal me. And sometimes we get sad because God doesn't answer us. But understand, here's our mistake. We are sad because we are really focusing on the wrong place. 
We're still focusing on the temporal, not the eternal that is secured for us. Yes, God does, does not give us our temporal ones sometimes, but He has given us our eternal needs. So recognize that it's only when we begin to look away from temporal blessings and focus on eternal blessings do we fully um, appreciate the immensity of Jesus' blessings for us. So this is point number two. Why do we follow Jesus? Do we follow Jesus wrongly, focusing only on His temporal gifts rather than His eternal gifts? This is point number three now. Do we wrongly follow Jesus, trusting in our own works instead of His work for salvation? Now let's read on in our text. Jesus says in verse 27 and 28, He says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him have God the Father sealed. Verse 28, Then said unto him, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? So looking at verse 27 here, how will one find this life-giving meat that will bring eternal life? Well, Jesus states it very clearly and I've highlighted it there. It says that the Son of Man shall give, my emphasis is give, give to you. For him have God the Father you. Jesus is stating it very plainly. How is eternal life gained? It is a gift from God through Jesus, whom the Father has approved with a seal. So salvation is a gift. Jesus makes it very clear. But when we read on in verse 28, we see that the crowd didn't seem to get the point again. Look at the reply. They say in verse 28, Then said they unto him, Jesus, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, so you see here that instead of focusing on how eternal life is a gift, the crowds focused on works. They wanted to know how they could work their way perhaps to eternal life. They wanted to work miracles perhaps. And so Jesus once more corrects their wrong theology. He tells them in verse 29. Jesus said unto them, This is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one He has sent. In other words, you don't have to do any work for eternal life. The only work you need to do is to place your faith in Jesus, whom God has sent, to trust in His finished work. Now consider with me an analogy. Some of the indigenous tribes in Africa apparently use little small strips of cloth as their currency. So we have money here, right? Pieces of paper. Over there, they have pieces of cloth. Some of them, the very, very uh, remote tribes, use cloth as currency. Now there's nothing wrong with little strips of cloth as it were, right? It's, it's legitimate currency there. But let's assume that these, these people came to Singapore with their currency and they wanted to use these little strips of, of cloth to, to buy their way to Singapore. The answer is no way, right? They can't do it. These, no matter how many strips of cloth they accumulate, they will not pay for their trip here. Now, how would they get to Singapore? Well, the only way for them to get to Singapore is for someone with acceptable currency to buy their way here. It's very simple. Now, such is our dilemma as human beings. In God's economy, we are just like, like these remote ancient tribes. And our good works are little strips of cloth. Filthy rags is what the Bible tells us. Worthless. Now, nothing wrong with little strips of cloth on this earth. Good works are great here. Right? They are of value here, but in God's economy, in, the, in a perfect city, before an infinitely holy God, no matter how much little cloth we accumulate, we cannot buy our way to heaven. And so how can we get to heaven? Well, the scripture tells us there is only one man with legitimate currency, and that man is Jesus. As people who are church, we know that Jesus paid the price of our sins on the cross so that you and I can get our way to God's kingdom. And so Jesus reminds us today, works cannot get us to heaven. That's in the text. No, the only work that is required from us is to believe, to have faith in Jesus, the Son of God, 
who gave his life for us on the cross. That is point number three. Do we wrongly follow Jesus, trusting in our works instead of his works for salvation? Now let's move on to the fourth wrong reason to following Jesus. Do we wrongly follow Jesus for the thrill of science and not for him? Do we wrongly follow Jesus for the thrill of a miracle instead of following him? So back to the text. Now, understand that Jesus had just established to the crowd that eternal life is through faith in him. That was just established. So the crowd responds in verse 30. They said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see you, uh, sorry, that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? And so on first reading, it appears that the crowd wanted proof, right? That they, um, Jesus claimed to be God, to give eternal life. Now show us a sign. Show us a miracle. Prove it. But if you remember the context, was proof really what they, they wanted? Now remember, this crowd was the very same crowd that just witnessed Jesus multiplying the five loaves and the two fishes. Remember the feeding of the 5,000? This just happened before them. Now we're not talking about pulling a rabbit out of a hat or, you know, take out an orange by a slide of hand. Now, this is this lousy magic, right? Jesus is multiplying thousands of loaves and fishes before them. Many of them witnessed this. And imagine, in the minds, they would be blown away, even for a modern audience, right? Imagine if this were America's Got Talent and a magician multiplied before you thousands of food, thousands of fishes. It would have blown them away. Would you think then that the crowd wanted a miracle to prove that Jesus is truly the Messiah and God? Hey, Jesus, prove yourself. You're not that special. It doesn't make sense, right, having seen the miracle? So my guess is that proof was not what they wanted. They simply wanted to have their stomachs filled again. They wanted more food. And this time round, they wanted a bigger miracle. They wanted Jesus not just to give them one meal, but a, perhaps a continuous supply of food. A greater sign to feed their needs was what they wanted. Listen to their request as we read on to verse 30 and 31. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may believe and see you? What work do you permit? And then they go on to say, Our fathers did eat, eat, sorry, our, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. So here we see the basic argument, right? Our fathers ate manna, manna in the desert that was available for 40 years. Now, Jesus, you ought to match that. Right? You ought to supply us continuously. Food, basically a greater sign. Fill our needs. And even though Jesus had already done a miracle, even though Jesus had already proven that he was a Messiah, the people were still focused on signs and not the person of Jesus. You know, if you think about it, Signs and miracles are double-edged. Um, on one hand, when we see a miracle, it can lead us to positive faith in God, greater faith in God. But on the other hand, a miracle can be so powerful that it can negatively distract us away from God. And so the warning from God through His Word today is don't let the wonder of, of miracles distract us from the wonder of Jesus now, I found it interesting that if you study the book of John, John records for us Jesus' miracles, but he very intentionally downplays the glory of the miracles. Right? I don't know if you have ever noticed, but unlike the other Gospels of Matthew and Mark, John doesn't dramatize the miracle accounts. It's very fascinating. You, you know, the way he writes, he kind of states miracles as just facts. Really, no adverbs or adjectives to glamorize the miracles. You know, we don't see John saying, Jesus gloriously, amazingly multiplied um, five loaves and two fishes to potentially 15,000 people if you count for the, the men and women. Right? No, no, John simply says in chapter 6. Um, it's not the slide, but let me read it for you. John 6, 11. This is the account of the miracle. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, get up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. That's it. He just fed thousands of people. He just did a miracle of, of, of the grandest scale. 
but no glamorization, no, no glorification of a miracle. John does the same thing with the, the walking on water. John, John doesn't say, amazing, Jesus defies physics, walks on water. Do you know that Jesus walked at, on at least six kilometers of water, if you do the, if the geography in the text? That's fascinating, isn't it? And, you know, the entire boat teleported, right? That's not what John said. He could have. But John simply says in, 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 in chapter 6, verse 18, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When he had rowed about three to four miles, they see Jesus walking on the sea. And he came near the boat and got in. And immediately, they were at the land at which they were going. Now again, an amazing miracle, but no glamorization, no glorification of the miracle. Now why does John do this? Well, the reason is very simple. John doesn't want us to focus on the glory of the miracle. He wants us to focus on the glory of Jesus. And so know that in the book of John, I, I understand that Zion Bishan is familiar with the book of John, right? We, we know that John uses the word sign for miracles, isn't it? Now, what is a sign? The point of a sign is not to draw attention to itself. You don't go to a sign and go, wow, the sign says Marina Bay Sands. No, the sign points you to something greater, isn't it? So the point of a miracle is not to draw attention to itself, but the point of a sign is to point to God, to Jesus. And so in application, when we Christians experience miracles in our lives, God answers prayers in marvellous ways. God dramatically heals a sickness of yours. Now don't just marvel at the, the miracle, right? Wow, I can't believe I'm healed. Wow, I can't believe God listens to me. Right? Wow, I was going through a hard time, but now I'm free. You know, that's amazing. No, that's not what miracles are for. Miracles should lead us to the glory and the greatness of our good Lord who loves us, who performs these things in our lives. Let's move on now. Fifth wrong way to follow Jesus. Do we wrongly follow Jesus failing to recognize that he's the source of life's blessing? Do we wrongly follow Jesus failing to recognize that he is the source of, of life's blessings. Now, reading on to verse 32. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, my father did. Now here we see the, the mistake the Jews made. Well, they basically misattributed the source of blessing, the source of the manna in the story of Exodus. Now they assumed Moses was the one who gave the Israelites manna. But we all know it was, it was God, isn't it? Back in Exodus 16, the Lord told Moses, and I quote, I will rain bread from heaven for you. God says, I will rain the bread for you. And you know what Moses' job was to do? To go and collect the bread. Right? He's the bread collector, right? He goes and collects the bread. And, and, and look what the Jews at Jesus' day had done. They claimed that the manna was from who? From Moses, not God. And so Jesus tells them, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. It was God, my Father. And so brothers and sisters, the question that ought to be asked for each of us this morning is that, are we guilty too of failing to recognize that life's blessings come from God? You know, in Singapore, most of us are what we call secular humanists. We believe, we take a very humanistic approach to life. We think that our jobs are a result of our intellect and our hard work. We think our healing is a result of antibiotics or you know, resting and our efforts. Our success, perhaps, is a series of fortunate events in our lives. And we basically take a humanistic approach to achieve blessings. But Jesus directs his audience in us today that we must remember God in life's goodness. That we should not misattribute life's blessings to someone else. Now, in fact, if you know the scriptures, James chapter 1, verse 17 tells us this, that every good gift comes from above. Does it say some good gifts? Does it say only when you pray and then God gives good gifts? No, it doesn't say that. It says every good gift, everything good in your life is a gift from God. And so do we recognize this? Do we understand this? Do we, do we see God, as the grand weaver behind all of life's circumstances and attribute all of the blessings in life to God's goodness. So let's do that. 
to understand and recognize God's goodness in our lives. Let's move on now to the sixth wrong reason to following Jesus. Do we wrongly follow Jesus for earthly bread instead of heavenly bread? Do we wrongly follow Jesus for earthly bread instead of heavenly bread? Now, in the next few verses, Jesus will focus on the metaphor of bread. And what Jesus seeks to do is to help us understand that while manna, while physical bread is important on this earth, it is not their greatest need. Their greatest need, rather, is the true bread, which is Jesus himself. He says in verse 32, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. Now, before we dive deeper into this text, let's understand the significance of bread in the original context. You see, for many of us uh, in Singapore, you look at all the spread of food. In Singapore, we have all kinds of food, isn't it? But um, you know, we have noodles, we have meat, we have desserts, all the lovely things that we have to eat. But in the original audience, that was not the case. You see, for the original audience, bread was the essential staple food. That's pretty much what they ate almost every day to stay alive. According to my Bible encyclopedia, the Hebrews counted bread together with water, in fact. It's interesting, right? You know, can you live without water? Cannot, right? In the same way, that's how the Hebrews saw bread. It was an essential food for, for daily nourishment and existence. And basically, when the Jews didn't have bread, they would feel that their lives were in danger. So we see here food was a critical food that kept them alive. Without bread, they would die, basically. And so Jesus will borrow this metaphor of bread to establish that he himself is the true bread. The life-giving bread that is superior to any ordinary bread that people were after. And so what are the differences between Jesus and ordinary earthly bread? What makes Jesus so special? Now this morning, I'd like to share with us three differences between Jesus, the true bread, and ordinary bread that highlights his importance. Firstly, in our line, this is the first uh, difference. Physical bread only gives temporary life, but Jesus gives eternal life. You see, physical bread, while important, doesn't really do anything with permanence, isn't it? It's like you eat a, 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 a piece of bread, it's a few hundred calories. The energy that you get from it probably is good for, if you stretch it, maybe a day. Right? That's all it is. But physical bread can't give life to the dying person, isn't it? It's just like Moses' bread. Well, the, the generation that ate heavenly bread, right? They had special bread from heaven. Now, guess what? The good news is, true to the truth in our text, they all died. Huh? Those guys who ate this wonderful heavenly bread that fell from heaven, they're all dead and gone. Right? That's why Jesus corrects the audience that, that manna, Moses' bread, was nothing very special. It is not true bread. True bread comes from heaven and gives life that's what Jesus says in verse uh, 33. He says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and gives, giveth life unto the world. And so that's the key difference, right? Physical bread, sorry, physical bread only gives temporary life, but Jesus offers eternal life. That is the key distinction. Now, the second difference between ordinary bread and Jesus, the true bread, now this is the second point, 6b, Physical bread is only good for a fixed locale, whereas Jesus, the true bread, is good for the entire world. Well, it's a simple principle. If I had some bread here, we could only feed some of us, isn't it? Or if I had one slice of bread, it, was, it would only be good for me. The manna from heaven from Moses was only good for Israel. But Jesus is telling us that his bread is not like that. His bread is good for the whole world. It giveth life unto the whole world. Right? And then that's the beauty of, of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Jesus, the bread of life, is good for the whole world. Third difference that makes Jesus' true bread better than ordinary bread. Well, physical bread doesn't satisfy, but Jesus satisfies completely. Now look with me to verse 30, 34 and 35. Jesus said, Oh, sorry. Then said they unto Jesus, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. 
Now let me, let's, let's do a mental exercise. Take for a moment to imagine the best bread you ever had in your whole life. Okay, I know young people uh, like to go cafe hopping, right? All this beautiful sourdough bread, all these croissants. Uh, imagine the best bread you had in your whole life. Fresh bread, crispy on the surface, moist internally. And then, what? Wow, the kids are all crying because they don't, they don't have the best bread, right? Take some butter, you know, spread it in. Imagine, huh? don't you think of the crying, think of the bread. Great stuff, right? Good question, huh? Question now, huh? Show of hands. How many people are hungry now? Quite a few of you, right? The most a bit, sorry, uh, refreshment. Is there refreshments later? Uh, sorry, refreshment team. I uh, just burst the bubble, right? They're all thinking of this gourmet stuff, right? The point is this. After eating the best breads in the world, we can still be hungry, huh? right? We can still be hungry for more food. The best breads don't satisfy. By the way, friends, that's how materialism works, isn't it? Those of us who are older, more mature, will know how this works. When we humans chase after the material, we want that new phone, we want that new house, we want that new promotion, and when we get it, what do we realize? Does it satisfy? Not really, right? Yeah, it was great for a few weeks. It was great when I bought the phone for a few uh, days. But after that, we realized that it's not that great after all. It's, it's pretty ordinary. That, friends, is the inadequacy of physical bread. Right? A metaphor of the material world. Even though enjoyable and necessary, great bread, great, great promotions, great whatever, fill in the blanks, they do not satisfy. True bread, on the other hand, Jesus is completely different. He tells us in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth for me shall never thirst. In other words, Jesus is saying, I satisfy you. I will fill your soul. Now, does that mean that when we follow Jesus, we will never experience hunger and thirst? No, that's not what it means. It really means we know where to turn to when we are hungry, when we are thirsty. Instead of enjoying the glory of the material that cannot satisfy, we ought to enjoy the glory of Jesus that is a never-ending supply. So let us ask ourselves, does, does Jesus satisfy you this morning? Well, He should. Let me share with you some of Jesus' attributes. To name a few, it's in the Bible. According to the Bible, Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our joy. Jesus is our atonement for sin. Jesus is our sanctifier. He sets us apart for God. Jesus is our shepherd. He will lead us. Jesus is our hope. He ushers in new kingdom. Jesus is our Lord. He is the ruler of the universe. He holds all things together. Jesus is our closest family. He is our brother. Jesus is our honor. Jesus is our master. Jesus is our head. He directs us, gives us wisdom in life. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Jesus is our provider. He is our comfort. He is our physician, our redeemer. He is the fountain of life. He is our prosperity, our treasure, our faithful friend. He is our life, our truth, our beloved. He is the bread of life. Can you begin to sense just a little bit of the value of Jesus? He is not gourmet bread. He is much greater than that. He is everything to us of supreme value. And that's why we ought to focus on heavenly bread this morning. Do we focus merely on earthly bread over heavenly bread? That is the sixth wrong reason to follow Jesus. Final wrong reason to follow Jesus, this is the last point. Do we wrongly follow Jesus selfishly expecting ministry success? Instead of selflessly pursuing God's will and trusting in God's sovereignty to save. It's a long statement, but bear with me. Now, this particular application didn't come directly from Jesus in our text, but it came from my meditation. You see, sometimes when, when we work hard in ministry, we hope to have a proportionate uh, amount of success in that we expect to we put in X amount of hours, we hope to see X amount of converts, you know, X amount of members passionate in, in their work with Jesus, but in reality... Hard work doesn't always correlate to, to success. Sometimes even though we can put in 100% in ministry, we can still face objection, we can still face um, unbelief. 
Now, such was the case in Jesus in our text, wasn't it? You see, even though Jesus did everything perfectly in ministry, he taught the crowds, he did a miracle, people still didn't believe him. And we see that in verse 36, as Jesus addresses the unbelief in the crowd. This is what he says. Verse 36. But I, say unto, but I say to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. Now tell me, if you were in Jesus' shoes, how would you feel, right? You have done all you can. You have done all these grand miracles. You have given them clear instructions, right? In their face, perfect teaching, telling them what's wrong with them. Yet they do not believe. Well, put in the hard work, do the greatest miracles, people do not follow. How would you feel? But we would certainly be upset, perhaps even angry, right? If you were the leader of such people. But consider Jesus' response in our text. I don't think we can sense any anger here if you read it. Verse 37, he says this, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Right? Such, such composure, such wisdom. Now what Jesus is saying here is that he's not affected by the lack of unbelief. Why? Because he trusts in his Father completely. He trusts in the Father's election the Father's preservation, and, and basically declaring that his trust in ministry is not in ministry success, his trust in ministry is in the Father to guarantee the results. So let's read on to verse 38. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And so know what we can learn from Jesus' attitude, those of us who are serving in ministry. Ministry is not about my will, your will, what we want, what you want, or what successes we hope to see. Rather, ministry is about doing the will of God who sends us. That means the call to ministry is not a call to guarantee success. It's not that your pastors work hard, therefore the church will grow. That's not how it works. The call to ministry is fundamentally a call to faithfully pursuing God's will, even if it means facing failure in ministry. Now, wasn't that the pattern of Jesus' ministry? Even after years of persistence and, and faithfulness, not seeing results, being persecuted, opposed, and ultimately dies on the cross. Now, reading on to verse 39 and 40, Jesus once more was stressed again the sovereign hand of, uh, that can be trusted in unsuccessful ministry. He says in verse 39 and 40, And this is the will of him, that is the Father, who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he had given me, but raise it up on the last day. So once more, we repeat this, verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And I'll raise Him up on the last day. And so in, in these verses, it tells us of our assurance when we face ministry failure. Is this, that everyone that puts their faith in Jesus will with certainly come to faith raised up on the last day. That means we can be at peace even when ministry is, isn't doing too well we can be at peace even when, when uh, things are out of control, it's because people that need to be saved will be saved in His sovereign timing. And so the final lesson from Jesus in our text is this. In the midst of ministry difficulty, hardship, things are not going on our, our, our way, let us not selfishly focus on what we want, but let us learn to trust in God's good time to save whom He has chosen. And so we've come to the end of our text. The beautiful gospel is, is, is mentioned right at the end of it. And I'd like to remind us, believers, God's people today, what are our reasons for following Jesus? And so let me do a recap. From the narrative of John 6, 22 to 40, Jesus uncovered seven wrong reasons to following him. Firstly, do we wrongly follow Jesus only for his gifts and not for him? Instead of focusing on the giver, we focus on the gifts. Secondly, do we wrongly fo follow Jesus focusing only on His temporal gifts, His daily provision, His, 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 um, his provision for us, instead of the more significant gifts of eternal life? Thirdly, do we wrongly follow Jesus thinking that we can save ourselves, trusting in our own works rather than the works of God? Fourthly, do we ro fo wrongly follow Jesus simply follow Him for the tree of signs, just chasing the miracles rather than focusing on 
the miracle worker himself. Fifthly, do we wrongly follow Jesus, failing to recognize that he's the source of all of life's blessings, that he's the source of all good things? And we mustn't confuse the, the means of delivery with the source. Sixthly, do we wrongly follow Jesus for earthly bread instead of heavenly bread? Are we, like the crowd, chasing after material things alone and failing to recognize that we have the bread of life, the all-glorious Jesus, our Savior, that gives eternal life, that brings blessing to the entire world, who satisfies completely? And seventhly, do we wrongly follow Jesus, selfishly expecting ministry success instead of selflessly pursuing the Father's will? Now, having heard from Jesus today, let us learn to follow Jesus authentically, putting Him first, trusting that it is only through Him that eternal life is given, and that we must pursue Him, Him alone, above all else. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Do speak to each of us individually. Lord, you know our weaknesses. You know where our thoughts have wavered. We pray that your spirit will redirect us back to you, away from our carnal and sinful desires, but to follow you for who you are, the bread of life, who gives us eternal life, who satisfies us perfectly. Help us to see this, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name.